from uh, 7th century of the common era till the beginning of 20th century. There were several upsurges in different parts of India, which were the expression of devotion. And we call these upsurges bhakti movements. But of late, I have stopped using the word movement because this whole vocabulary comes from Western historiography. People are talking about Orientalism and its dangers. Now I am becoming more and more aware of Occidentalism and its dangers. So just because there was a, there was a Reformation movement in the West, we should have something like Protestant movement, we should have something like that. The two are completely different phenomena. So these days I prefer to call them Bhakti traditions. Uh, the word the tradition is the more unfashionable word than movement. Uh, so there were several of them. It begins in Tamil Nadu and then it spreads to Karnataka and to uh, Andhra and then Maharashtra, Gujarat on this side, the one uh, current towards the northwest, another from Karnataka to Andhra, from Andhra to North India, another current from Andhra to Orissa, Orissa to Bengal, another from North India to uh, Assam, Northeast, then from Bengal to uh, Manipur. Then the process starts in the first millennium and it continues right up to the middle of the second millennium. But even before the middle of the second millennium, we have another second wave of bhakti movements which are slightly different from the previous bhakti movements. <clears throat> and it's, there's no clear dividing line between the two phases of bhakti movements. But they're somewhat different from the previous bhakti movements. Devotion. And of course, there is a devotional content in all the theistic religions of the world, like Christianity or Islam or in uh, uh, different tribal religions of the world, where there's some kind of belief in powers higher than human beings, polytheistic religions, pantheistic religions. So there is an element of devotion in that. For example, some people say that bhakti came from the Vedas. But I don't think so. In the Vedas you have a devotional element, but it's not bhakti. Because in all these primitive religions and uh, 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 in, 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 in non-bhakti devotion, if I can call it, Devotion to God, praising the God, is meant for some utilitarian purpose. In the Vedas they say, Shanchami, Mayaschami, Priyanchami, Nakamaschami, give me well-being in this world, give me well-being in the next world, fulfill all my desires and so on. So it is a kind of exchange. I give you this worship. I offer you this sacrifice. I praise you so many times. So you give me something in return. Bhakti is pure love of God. There's no exchange. It's just giving without expectation. 
So it's complete surrender to the divine. So bhakti, of course, Sanskrit scholars go into all kinds of uh, etymological exercises. Say bhakti comes from this dhatu bhaj. I'm not going into that. The content of bhakti tradition, the major emphasis of what we call bhakti traditions, is complete love, unconditional love, and surrender to the divine. And this divine in bhakti traditions is sometimes seen in the human form, anthropomorphic, sometimes as an abstract divine principle. When it is seen in the anthropomorphic form, it's called saguna bhakti, saguna with, 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 with qualities. If it's seen in the abstract form, it's called nirguna without qualities. For example, in North India, we have two traditions of Vaishnava and Bhakti, one represented by Tulsidas, which is Saguna Bhakti, and Kabir Das, which is, which is Nirguna Bhakti. Though, again, the dividing line is not very clear. It's not a question of either or, but it's a question of more or less. So some Bhakti traditions are more Saguna, some more Nirguna. So we can classify Bhakti movements in terms of the major deities of a certain Bhakti tradition. Shaivite or Vaishnavite in Bengal, in Assam, you have Shakta Bhakti, where the Mother Goddess is the, uh, some aspect of the Mother Goddess is, is the Ishtadevata. And bhakti is addressed to the Ishta Devata. Ishta Devata means, Ishta means desire, Devata. The divine embodiment of our desires. And, and they locate this, 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 this uh, potential of fulfilling all our desires in a divine principle represented in some anthropomorphic human form, a quasi-human form, like Shiva, or Vishnu, or one of the incarnations of Vishnu, Krishna, or Rama, or Kali, or the goddess, or Ganapati in Maharashtra we had Ganapata school, Ganapati was the chief deity. In Tamil Nadu, Burugan becomes that kind of deity. And so on. Or it could be some abstract principle, like in the Bhakti uh, uh, traditions of Kashmir, for example, where Shiva is a principle, not a deity. But in Tamil Shaivism, Shiva is a deity. But in Kashmir Shaivism, Shiva is a principle. And sometimes it's in between. Virashaivism, for example, is both Saguna and Nirguna. <clears throat> so, uh, Bhakti can be classified along uh, the lines of Saguna, Nirguna, Shaivite, Vaishnava, Shakta, and so on. And also on the basis of the region, Karnataka Bhakti, Maharashtra Bhakti, uh, Gujarati Bhakti, and so on. Uh, Padma Purana, one of the medieval texts, speaking about the genealogy of Bhakti, says this beautiful girl called Bhakti was born in Tamil Nadu. She grew up in Karnataka, attained and her youth in Maharashtra, and matured in, uh, uh, in uh, Gujarat. But it's only one part of the story, because Bhakti also went to other regions. So this, this formulation doesn't talk about the spread of bhakti in the east, along the eastern coast of India and uh, in Bengal and Assam and Manipur and Kashmir and Punjab and Rajasthan and so on. So the, the, this, 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 this impulse which suddenly emerges in Tamil Nadu around 7th century of the common era by about 
18th century, when we were on the threshold of colonialism, it had become all-pervading throughout No, I said each regional bhakti has its own specific char char characteristics. If you look at Karnataka, in Karnataka, we have three important phases of bhakti. One is what we now somewhat inaccurately describe as Vireshiva movement, but I would like to call it Sharana movement. Which was Shaivite. Second was during Vijayanagara Empire around 14th and 15th century, Vaishnavite is called Haridasa tradition. And then, on the eve of the uh, uh, colonialism, before the advent of colonialism, we had another bhakti movement, bhakti efflorescence, that we call them unfoldments. Efflorescences, rather, movements, expressions, whatever. This is called uh, Swaravachana efflorescence, which is neither Shaivite nor Vaishnavite, neither Saguna nor Nirguna. It's a kind of syncretic, and it was not located in one place like Virish, uh, the Vachana Sharana movement or Haridasa movement. This had many centers in different parts of Karnataka. And uh, 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 so these were the three important phases. So the literary expression of the Sharana movement was the Vachana. The, of course, the Sharana tradition also produced other forms which are lost because many of these uh, poets talk about their songs and dances and theatres, but these are lost now. The major expression of Haridasa movement is called Kirtana. Praising the Lord. Uh, the major exponents are like Purandara Dasa, Kanaka Dasa, who composed mostly a form of literary musical genre called Kirtani Kanaka. The expression of these uh, Swaravachana traditions called Swaravachana. Swara means related to singing, song compositions. Okay. Now, before I talk about Vachana, let me briefly introduce the Sharana movement. Now, some people call it Virasheva movement. Some people, like, for example, there's one scholar called Nandimat. He thinks it's, 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 it's part of Virasheva religion. Some feel it was a kind of protest movement. They call it Lingayatism. To this day, in the community which claims the heritage of uh, uh, Vachanas, of the Sharana uh, tradition, this debate is going on whether the, the nomenclature should be Lingayat or Virasheva. Some people say it's the same, they mean the same, and some people say it's part of Hinduism, some people say it's not Hinduism. The official, uh, 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 you know, 
representatives of this community called Virashiva Mahasabha have been urging the government of India to be declared non-Hindus. We say we don't believe in the Vedas, we don't uh, uh, observe this menstrual taboo, we don't believe in the national dharma. So we're not Hindus. Ours is a separate religion. But this uh, status of a independent religion has not been accorded to this community. But there are still some people in the community who say, no, 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 we are part of a greater Hinduism. Uh, this question has not been resolved because it not yet been resolved what is Hinduism. Nobody has given a clear definition of what is Hinduism. Uh, <clears throat> Sharana movement, because Virashaivism was a religion which antedated Sharana movement. And for instance, there are many Shaivagama, sacred texts of the Shaiva tradition, which preceded Sharana uh, 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 and uh, these Agamas were divided into three groups by scholars in Kashmir. Rudragama, Shivagama and Bhairavagama. Rudragama is the dualistic school of Shaivism. They say that Shaiva Siddhanta, which is Tamil Shaivism, is dualistic. Where there is no union between the bhakta and the deity. There is only uh, 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 worship, adoration. Bhakta cannot become one with the deity. In Kashmir Shaivism, is complete monism. And the bhakti they talk about is Advaita Bhakti. When I worship Shiva, I am worshipping myself. Because Shiva is the, the most expanded form of my own self. So it's monastic Advaita. Whereas the philosophy represented in, uh, in Vidashaivism is called Dvaita Dvaita. Dualistic, monastic. It begins with dualism and ends in uh, union. But if we look at the vachana, vachanas, it looks like these vachanas, like Upanishads, are the spontaneous expressions of these, this group of saints who number more than 200, who come from different castes, both men and women. There are Brahmins. There are untouchables, there are cobblers, and there are uh, barbers, there are uh, washermen, and so on. And it is believed that this movement, it was a movement which uh, emanated from a, the city of Kalyad, which is the, the capital first of Chalukyas and later of Kalachuryas. And this city is now part of uh, uh, Bida district in Karnataka. So, uh, one group of scholars believe that Basavan now is the form of Lingayatism. Others say that Basavanna was a Virashaiva he brought some reforms in Virashaivism. This question cannot be resolved. But my own view is that something called Virashaivism anti-rigid Basavanna. And I do not see any fundamental difference between Ningayat and Virashaivism. But it was Basavanna who <coughs> may have given with a kind of social significance. 
and the site of this uh, whole uh, 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 florescence is said to be Kandiana, where Basavana served as the finance minister of the Kalachuri Emperor Pichero. So it is said that he established an academy of sales called Anubhava Vantapa. Again, we have no historical evidence. There is one stone mantap in the city of Kalyana, which they say that this was uh, Anubhava Vantapa. But these, uh, the details about this Anubhava Vantapa are found in hagiographic uh, epics written in Kannada after the 15th century. Uh, but because these Vachana poets mention each other, it's quite possible that they were all, uh, 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 they belong to the same period. Most of them belong to the same uh, Most, the best known ones like Basavanna, Allama Prabhu, Akamaha Devi, and so on. Uh, and these, what, these Vachanas were composed orally by these saints. And these saints were not full time sannyasis. There were some full time sannyasis, like Allama Prabhu, who is considered to be the great guru of all these sharanas. But most of them were householders. Basavanna was a finance minister. And there was one Madhuvarasa who was a minister. There was somebody called, uh, uh, there was Madhara Chennai who was a cobbler, Madhivara Machaya who was a washerman, and Ambigara Chaudhaya who was a boatman. People from all professions. Nuliya uh, Chandaya who was a rope maker. And uh, Urilinga Petti was from an untouchable community, but who became the head of a monastery. Maybe he belonged to a later period. So there was no bar of caste to get into this, uh, uh, in this sect. So where did this begin? Of course, about this origin of the Sharana movement, there are different uh, opinions. But uh, in my opinion, it started sporadically, different places. And the earliest Vachana poets, Vachana Kalas, whose texts are now available to us, <coughs> are Madara Chennaya, Chennaya the Cobbler. Devara Dasimaya, Dasimaya the Weaver. Now all these Vachana poets proudly put the name of their caste in front of the names. They suffix the caste name with their own pers personal names. So they were not ashamed of the caste, they were not proud of their caste. So there was some kind of acceptance of all castes in this <coughs> fraternity of uh, Sharanas. It looks like we have some hist historical evidence to prove this, that around Basavanna's period, this stream widened and there must have been a lot of interactions between them. Whether Anubhava Mantapa existed or not, there was some kind of venue where they exchanged <coughs> their views because the language of Vachanas are dialogic. They're always talking to somebody, each other, to God, to their antagonists. And Vachana There has been debate about Vachana. Vachana is essentially uh, a literary genre which was born in Kannada, 
or is it a regional manifestation of a broader uh, uh, expressive genre? I believe that it's a manifestation of a broader expressive genre. If you look at bhakti traditions from all over India, two words recur, vachana, vani. Not only bhakti movements, also spiritual movements, like Kabir Pant or Goraknath Pant and so on. Kabir vachan, and then vak, lalla vak, goraka vani, vachana, svara vachana. So, it is speaking, spontaneous expression like speaking. Vachana also means making a promise. One of the important definitions of Vachana in the Vachanas themselves is that <coughs> I am making this promise to you. Now the attack, the protagonists of the Vedas and Puranas and so on, because as Machideva the Vashaman says in one of his poems, they go one way, their words go another. There is no concordance between word, word and speech. So they insist on the unity of Nare and Nuri, speech and action. <coughs> so, vachana is a promise made that <coughs> I speak as I act and I act as I speak. I think this is an important uh, meaning of vachana, which most scholars have not looked at. They say that it's prose poem, this and that. And so vachana is the expression of the felt truth, experienced truth. It's an expression of realization. There are so many people who thought that vachana is a kind of prose form, they've tried it, but they're not vachanas. So vachana in spirit, not just as a literary form. <coughs> Madhivara Machideva, Machaya the washerman, calls these people who imitate the form of vachana, vacha rachanakaras. They create the makers of, the, the producers of speech construct. But it's not vachana, it's some, not something that emanates from one's realization of the divine essence. So this to me is the meaning of question. And though we call, we classify Sharana tradition with other bhakti movements, it's a bhakti tradition with a difference. Because not all the vachanas are about bhakti. Even in other Bhakti traditions, not all the compositions are about bhakti. There are some social satires, didactic uh, uh, compositions. Here you have a kind of dialectics between two poles of expression. One which I call metaphoric. We are trying to create a form. Another paradoxical. We are trying to break the form. And, for example, the vachanas of Allama Prabhu are mostly paradoxical. This, this trope in Kannada is called Bedagu, which is similar to other similar tropes in uh, spiritual literature elsewhere. In Tantric tradition, this is called Sangha Vasa, the twilight language or the, or, the, or, the, or the puzzling language. 
whereas in Akkamha Devi, for example, you have a rich metaphoric language. So the, the Vachana expression ranges between the pole of the metaphor and the pole of the paradise. In between there are many other things. <clears throat> and the beauty of this uh, genre is that it can be sung, it can be recited, it can be acted out, it can be danced out. So like most bhakti texts, Vachana texts are not reading literature, it's the kind of the constitute performance text. This great, though the Vachana uh, studies began before the period of Vasavarna, thanks to the compositions of Chennai the Cobbler, Dasimi the Viva, and uh, uh, several others, Revana Siddha. And all these saints came from backward communities, what we now call other backward communities. Chennai was a cobbler. You belong to the uh, 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 Dalit community. We call them Dalits now because the Constitution of India has prohibited the use of the word untouchable. Dalit community. And then they were Dasimaya. He belonged to the, the Viva caste, which is a backward community. And Revada Siddha, he belonged to the shepherd community. There was somebody called Kambavi Bhoganna. He must have been a Dalit. Uh, so, it must have, it's a kind of movement which, uh, it's a kind of study which began with these uh, saint poets of um, uh, uh, what we now call backward communities. Then, people who came from, for example, Allama Prabhu, one of the greatest gurus of Vachanakaras, he came from the Devadasi caste, which was not considered to be a very high caste in those uh, days. And the descendants of this Dev Devadasi caste are a very backward caste these days. They're called Natuas in Tamil Nadu and Karnataka. Some of them came from high caste, like Basavanda, Akamadevi, who came from a Vaishya community, and uh, so on. <coughs> so, during the time of Basavanda, there was a great uh, uh, debate, dialogue, and some kind of uh, orchestration that went on during time, this time between different uh, poets. And this accords uh, for the dialogic uh, nature of Vachana texts. But after Basavandra's period, it kind of tapers off. And there's a revival of this Vachana uh, genre in the uh, 16th and 17th centuries, again in 20th centuries. But these are kind of nostalgic revivals. They don't have the creative energy of that momentous period of the 12th century efflorescence. Uh, in the metaphorical you know, uh, kind of uh, vachanas, there's a very special kind of uh, metaphoricity which was brought into Vachanas by saints who came from different artisan castes. In fact, broadly, the uh, majority of Vachana uh, poets are from the artisan caste. <coughs> and uh, 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 some sociologists feel that in, uh, uh, until the medieval period, 
uh, all the uh, uh, cars, our diesel cars were divided into uh, right hand sect and the left hand sect. Now this uh, distinction now survives only among uh, the lids of uh, South India, Karnataka and Andhra. But this distinction divide applied to all artisan cars. I mean, broadly, the left-hand cars were those who had direct access to the means of production, like the goldsmith, washerman, barber, and so on. The majority of the Vashana poets belong to this, uh, uh, this uh, left-hand caste. For example, the uh, poets from the Lidh community are from the left-hand caste, Madara Chennaya, Madara Dureya, and so on. So these poets bring in the images from the area of the profession the labor. For example, a cowherd brings metaphor from his domain of experience. A cobbler like Madhava Chanaya, he has written a beautiful vachana where he compares the whole spiritual uh, process to the making of sandals. And uh, there is one uh, uh, Maraya, the toddy maker who brings in metaphors from the the the, the 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 area related to the making and distributing of toddy and so on. Some uh, goldsmiths will bring and the 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 the, the, Vaidya, the doctor was also a caste and there's somebody who brings metaphors from so this is not just a literary trope, this also embodies a philosophy. Now, what is, how is bhakti different from other approaches to spirituality? Broadly, though bhakti has a lot of sociological uh, significances, artistic significances, basically we must face the fact that it's, it's spiritual. What's the difference between bhakti and the one hand? And other spiritual paths like, uh, let's say, Vedanta or Buddhism or Jainism. Vedanta, Buddhism and Jainism, they emphasize the attainment of moksha, liberation. Whereas bhakti, the greatest bhakti say, we don't want anything. And this moksha oriented paths were a response to this worldly concerns of the Vedas. The Vedas are all about asking for good rains, asking for this and that, uh, progeny and uh, cattle and a uh, lot of women and so on. So, the salvific traditions or soterological tradition, as this is the word that Marchiya Eliade uses, these soterological traditions were the negation of the Vedic worldliness and bhakti is the negation of both the Vedic this worldliness and the other worldliness of soteriological traditions. So for example, the idea of uh, liberation or salvation in Buddhism and Jainism, you have to withdraw yourself from the world. I'm not talking about later Buddhisms of Tibet or uh, uh, China or Japan, where they, they developed in, uh, in, in along different lines. I'm talking about what is now called Tipitika Buddhism, original Buddhism. You have to withdraw the world, Dukkha, you have to withdraw from the world. And uh, so you have to withdraw both from, you have to abjure pleasures of this world. And say, Jainism is the same, the same thing. Jainism means 
this world is impure. You have to free yourself from ajiva, from budgaras, impurities, to attain purity. So it's a kind of withdrawal from the world. Whereas the Vedic, or if you look at another primitive tradition in India, or ancient tradition in India, Sangam ethos of Tamil Nadu, it's involvement in the world. But Bhakti kind of synthesizes both these approaches. You don't run away from the world, you live in the world, and you see the divinity in the world. So, everything you do becomes spiritual. This emphasis was already there in the Tantras, in Advaita Tantras of Kashmir, for example, uh, which uh, more or less belong to the same period of early Tamil Bhakti. Uh, most of the texts of Kashmiri Shaivism uh, were uh, written during this period. So, this idea of worship was there, but it emphasized the technique of worship, the meditative approach, discipline, whereas bhakti is the path of love. This is what makes bhakti different. So, you can see divinity. The first Tamil Shaivite uh, poets, the Vaishnavite poets, they saw the embodiment of the divine in the temple. Most of them sing about the temples of Tamil Nadu. At, at that time, Kerala was part of Tamil Nadu, uh, Tamil Aham. So, they talk about the deities of these temples. And they created a sacred geography of these temples. It's called Divya Desha. For example, Vaishnavites feel that Sri Rangam is the center of uh, uh, Vaishnavism, and Shaivites feel that Chidambaram is the center of. Uh, uh. But by 10th century, this had become, these temples were no more uh, sacred places. They had become, they assumed multifarious functions. They were like banks. They were like uh, 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 ad ad administrative centers. And uh, money, money, they also indulged in money lending, politicking, and so on. And temples barred the they were open only for high caste people others were barred from it so because the temple rejected people from irrespective of caste I mean people of some caste the Vachana poets rejected the temple They said that body is the temple. So this was, and they saw divinity everywhere. And most of them, they, because they were barred from the temple, they brought in <coughs> a <coughs> form of worship called Shiva Yoga. Of course, Shiva Yoga has different meaning in Kashmir Shaivism, and in uh, Tamil Shaivism, and again in Shakta Shaivism of worshipping a tiny shivalingam, madman shivalingam, worn on the body. This, this belief was central. Most of the Vachana poets talk about it. Not all of them subscribed to it, but most of them appear to have done, done that. <coughs> but this is a means to focus the mind. So when the mind becomes focused on this, ultimately, you in, in, in introject this divine symbol and then your own mind becomes the the the, the uh, 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 divinity so uh, the different technical terms used in uh, the vachanas for these different phases of spiritual evolution i don't want to complicate uh, uh, I mean this by bringing in all those technical details but the essence is this you start with the worship of <coughs> a shivalinga outside, not in the temple. <coughs> then 
you concentrate on it, the specific way of doing it, meditating on it, then it becomes part of your breath. And then it's absorbed into your mind. And then the division between you and Shiva. And majority of these Vaishnava poets talk about not the Puranic Shiva, the Tamil uh, poets, talk, uh, Saint poets talk about. They talk about Shiva's Tripura Dharana, Shiva's uh, marriage with Parvati and so on. Sometimes Vachana poets use these metaphors, but mostly they're talking about Shiva as a principle. The goal in the form of Shiva Lingam, non-anthropomorphic form. Again, it's not Stavara Linga of the temples. In Tamil Shaivism, Shiva is worshipped in the form of Shiva Lingam in the temples. Stavara, still Lingas. Whereas Ishta Lingas. So you have made this Ishta Linga and you are projecting your thoughts and your emotions into it. So this is the major basic spiritual practice which majority of uh, Sharanas uh, 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 accepted. And then this enables them to see divinity everywhere. And the path of spiritual evolution, they talked about, talk about is different from the yogic and the tantric path. And different from other schools of bhakti. <clears throat> and women have a place, an equal place alongside men. And most of these Vachana poets are married people. And <coughs> they also say, Sati Pati Gada Bhakti Ita Vapudas Shivangi. The worship of a uh, 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 husband and the wife pleases Shiva most. So they didn't keep out because some of the greatest Vachana uh, poets were women. Akma Devi, according to me, <coughs> the greatest Vachana poet is not Basavarna, not Allama Prabhu, but Akma Devi. Though many scholars don't accept this because we have this traditional uh, uh, prejudice against women becoming the leader, but to my mind, I started with the belief that Allah is the greatest poet. Now, if you ask me, because I have been with the Vachnas for the last 40 years, Akamadevi is not only the greatest Vachna poet, he is the greatest uh, poet in Kannada language. So, Vachna uh, 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 tradition has to its credit. Uh, it created the greatest poet of the language. And if you said that, Bhakti traditions created many of the literatures, though Kannada literature existed before Vachana period, but it's the Sharana tradition which gave a contemporary edge and the dialogic force and the down to earth uh, energy to, to, to uh, the language of poetry. And they some people say they didn't want to write poetry. It was unconscious poetry. In fact, there are some statements in the Vachanas that we don't care for poetry. But there are also some very thoughtful things they talk about. Uh, 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 what is the Vachana? They define it. And uh, uh, there's a famous Vachana by Vasavana, which is beautifully sung by uh, 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 some of the Hindustani singers like Malikajan Mansur and uh, 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 Sidram Chaburthi. If you should speak, your words should be like a string of words. If you should speak, your words should be legal, sharp, and crystal clear. If you should speak, your words should be like the glow of the ruby. If you should speak, your words should be, if you, if you should speak, the Lord, the Linga, 
should say quite so, quite so. But unless your words and actions match, the words and deeds are the same, how will he be pleased? So you can have all these virtues, but unless there's the unity, if your speech doesn't embody your actions, your actions don't embody your speech, then the Lord will reject you. Sometimes they define it as uh, 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 something beyond speech. And Siddharama, one of the saints, saint poet says, Vachana anabhavo vacho naiva. The experience of Vachana cannot be expressed in words. Still, they try to express it. And uh, in one of the dialogues between, which is uh, 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 imagined in uh, an anthology of Vachanas produced in the 14th century, Shuddhi Sampadne, between Allama Prabhu and uh, Muktayaka, woman saint, he, she challenges Allama Prabhu. She says, my brother Ajaganda was a great saint, but he never spoke. A person who is absorbed in truth never speaks. Shabuda Mukhudana Agira Beku. It should be innocent of words. Allama Prabhu says, Matam Buddha Jyotir Linga. The word itself is the Linga of light. Matam Buddha Jyotir Linga. Svaravam Buddha. Paratatva. Vavels are the ultimate truth. Taloshta Sabbutave Nada Bindu Kara Atita. Yogis have this experience of Nada Bindu Kara in the deepest states of experience. Consonants express that. Guheshwara na sharnaro, guri do suta gira na keda paru re. The, 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 the worshippers of, not Guheshwara, Gokeshwara, he is Ishtadevata. He is specific. Though all of them worship Shiva, they worship Shiva in a particular, if not in a particular form, with a particular name. So Gokeshwara, Allah ma prabhu sish to Deva, Gokeshwara. The, the, the worshippers of Gokeshwara do not become contaminated even when they speak. Elsewhere he says, you can't express this in words. Look, look at the coyness of the word. Words are running away. At the same time he recognizes this whole exercise of trying to embody in words what is beyond words. This is one of the basic uh, concerns of uh, 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 vachana. So uh, this uh, uh, genre created by saints poets from the depths of their experiences, depths of their convictions, will still continue to inspire uh, 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 people right up to our times. Not just bhaktas, not just virashaivas. And uh, these vachanas, uh, uh, the, the, the freedom, and, and, and one of the, another concern in vachanas is, is the, 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 this craving for freedom. Vasvanda says, Oje I don't know the <coughs> beats and uh, symbols. Tarabhana says, I know the, don't know the rules of Tala. Uh, 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 Devagana Brahmana Madhari, I don't know the rules of Nita. Kudala Sangama Deva, Ninaka Kedil Lavadi. So Basavana Shri Deva is Kudala Sangama, Shiva, uh, in, in a particular place called Kudala Sangama, uh, which also means the joining of rivers, confluence of rivers. Ninaka Kedil Lavadi, nothing can be take, taken away from me. You have no extinction. Nothing can destroy it. I sing as I please. So the sing, the dance, and uh, you know, uh, act out as I please without any inhibition, without any rules. And some of them go to the extent of uh, 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 taking off their clothes, which is what Akamadeva did. 
She says, Digambarave Divyambaravagi. The, the, all the directions, Digambara, the sky surrounding all the directions, that has become my Divyambara, that, that's become my sacred gar garment. So it's, it also expresses a great urge for freeing oneself from inhibitions. So bhakti is one of the means of transcending the limitations of the world. When we live in the world full of limitations, it's true that some people have said that this vachana movement, as they call it, is the revolution of mystics. There was a, a Nordic scholar who uh, has written a book called The Revolution of Mystics. Uh, but I, I don't like to use this term revolution. But it's not a, it's not a revolutionary literature, but it's definitely literature of inner transformation. It can be called transformative literature. You don't change the world, but you change yourself as a result of which uh, some people who are, are, are sensitive to your transformation will also experience the same kind of transformation. So this Sharana tradition is not, I don't want to equate it with a caste, the Vireshiva guys. Though most of the Sharanas, as I pointed out, believe in the wearing of this Ishtalinga, <coughs> it is a sect. In medieval India, most of the bhakti movements were part of sects. They are diksha pantas. They were initiation cults. So this was an initiation cult. Buddhism, for example, originally an initiation cult. We're using the word religion because we want to understand everything in terms of Western words. Buddha himself talks about, doesn't talk about Dhamma. In Buddhism means something else, cosmic law. He talks about Magga, Path, and Vaishnava boys talk about similar words, Patha, Bhatte, which means the path. So these were paths of initiation. So, but this initiation cult of Sharana, uh, uh, Sharanas, it created the greatest literary works of India. And there's no other example anywhere in world literature when you have the flaw, such a great literary poetry of florescence, when you have nearly more than 200 people from all walks of society, as if the whole world, the whole earth, has begun to speak. This has not happened in, 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 in the 20th century. In spite of the awakening of all the communities in post independence India, this kind of fluorescence has not happened. This is the kind of cultural energy that the uh, uh, Vachana tradition uh, released into, uh, into Kannada literature and culture.